I get in trouble a lot by the same things I say. It's not by the things I don't say, because I say plenty. But I started to say before I prayed for the offering that if anybody here today tells me your basketball bracket is unbroken, we'll need at least two IDs with your check. (laughs) Wow. Some major upsets. But you know what? There can be a lot of upset people when we come to the close of the age, when they find out Jesus is real, that life everlasting is gained only through Jesus Christ. This coexist thing that I keep reading on bumper stickers, this toleration thing I keep hearing, scares me a little bit. My God is a God of love. I don't have to kill anybody to get into heaven. I don't even have to go door to door selling a newspaper. All I have to do is believe in him and put my faith in him. And that's the gift of life. And the great shepherd left the eternal kingdom to come into this world to tell us that very thing, to show us that very thing. Jesus is our only hope. Jesus is the only way unto eternal life. Amen? Amen. All right, David, move a little bit closer to Nikki so that I don't worry about you two over here, okay? You got somebody in between you to move over to you? Let's compromise and each of you go a little bit closer. I mean, it's bad enough I already have to worry about Sam and Maria, you know. I know you're probably wondering if we'll ever get out of Psalm 23. The answer is no. It was a three-parter that's now in the third part, and there's still three more parts to go. But maybe we'll make it one day. Here we are, Psalm 23, first verse. One word we're going to emphasize. You know what word that is? The Lord is my shepherd, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He restores my soul. My shepherd restores my soul. Got it? Let's sing the invitation to go home. No, there's too much in between. You know something about sheep? I'm learning more and more as I read about sheep. Ted, I've never been a farmer. I've never been a shepherd. I've never had cattle or anything like that. Some of you do. That's great. But I've been reading about sheep. And the more I learn about sheep, uh, the more I realize they, they are like us in so many ways. And we are like them. And Jesus is the great shepherd. One of the things I've learned about sheep is that they can survive and even thrive in dry, semi-arid country uh, like we find in, in the Holy Land. But they still, this is the first answer in your sheet, so get ready. But they still require water. They need water. The shepherd plays a vital part, a crucial part in finding that still water's For his sheep. So your first two blanks are water and shepherd. You got that? All right. That shepherd is important for helping that sheep to find the water that's so necessary because the shepherd scouts out the land and he knows where the best drinking places are. It's to these spots, to those spots, that uh, the shepherd leads his flock. I find it interesting that the body of an animal, such as a sheep, such as you and me, is composed of about 70% water on average. So I'm not really fat, folks. It's just a lot of water. (laughs) That fluid, water, is used to maintain normal body metabolism. It's a portion of every cell that makes up the body that contributes to things like the digestive tract and all the normal life functions that are part of that which we call the body or the sheep. If the supply of water for an animal drops off, something called dehydration sets in. If you've ever been dehydrated, you know that 
nothing good comes of it. Um, the de dehydration of the tissues can result in serious damage to the tissues. It also means that the animal becomes weak and impoverished. Uh, just as the physical body has a capacity and a need for water, so the scripture points out to us that human beings, human personality, people like us, well, our human soul, the human soul has a capacity and a need for the living water of the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus himself said, I am the water of life. You take drink, you'll never thirst again. So our soul, that which is really us, needs the Spirit of God, needs the water of God, the Holy Spirit who comes to give us and quench our thirst. When sheep are thirsty, they become restless. And they set out in search of, of water to satisfy their thirst. If they're not led to the good water supplies, that, that clean, pure water, then, then the sheep will often end up drinking from polluted uh, potholes uh, where they'll pick up intestinal parasites that can be harmful or deadly to them. Now, I want you to think about the parallel in life. Do people not do the same thing? We're thirsting after something. And in, in, in many cases, instead of thirsting after that which is righteous, after God Almighty, we go in search of other things. And we satisfy self with the things of the world. Jesus Christ, our good shepherd, made it clear that thirsty souls of men and women can be fully satisfied when their capacity and thirst for spiritual life is fully quenched by drawing from himself. And we need daily to tap into the source of pure, living, clean, whole water. And that's found in Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, it says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. That word filled literally means satisfied. Um, my bracket in the basketball game has as much red ink on it as my test used to have when I was in school. You know, a lot of X's. I would be satisfied if I'd gotten everything right. Now, I would be shocked if I got everything right. But I'm satisfied when I'm drinking from my Lord and finding his righteousness for my daily walk. At the great feast in Jerusalem, Jesus boldly declared, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. To drink in spiritual terminology simply means to take in, to accept, to believe. That implies that, that a person who accepts and assimilates the very life of God in Christ to the point where it becomes a part of him finds that whole and real satisfaction. The difficulty in all of this is that people, men and women who are thirsty for God, often are unsure where to look or what they're really looking for, for that matter. Their inner spiritual capacity for God and divine life has never been developed or, or it's dried up. And, and it seems like they'll drink from any dirty pool to try and, and satisfy their thirst. And I think that's why there are so many religions in the world. I put that in quotes. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a way of life. It's a faith walk. It's trusting in the unseen. It's believing in the one who came to be one with us. And that's what satisfies our thirst. All the long and out throughout the long and complex history of earth's religion, pagan worship and human philosophy, all that is bound up 
in what I think is the insatiable thirst for God Almighty. We have found in countries that we have gone to where the word of God has not been translated into their language, where they've not heard the scripture like we have, that those folks are still seeking after that higher power. They're still seeking after Jehovah God, although they may not know who they seek after. And I think there are those in our community, those in our world today that are seeking after God. They're thirsting after God. When David composed this 23rd Psalm, I believe he knew this. Looking at life from the standpoint of a sheep, he wrote, He, the good shepherd, leadeth me beside the still waters. In other words, I think David said, He alone knows where the still waters are, where the quiet, deep, clean, pure, holy water is to be found. And that alone can satisfy the sheep and keep them fit and strong. He alone knows. Don't ever, don't ever fall for the trap that, that when someone says, well, all people believe in God. No, they don't. Allah and God are not the same. Jehovah God is Jehovah God, He and He alone. And Jesus is Jehovah God, and He says there is only one way into eternity. And He's either the biggest liar that's ever been, or He's the greatest truth that man has ever known. If anyone thirst, let him follow. come unto me and drink. Accept, believe, take in. He alone knows the way. Generally speaking, water for sheep came from three main sources. There was dew on the grass. There were deep wells often dug by the shepherd. And there were springs and streams. So dew on the grass, deep wells, springs and streams. That's where the, the shepherd would lead the sheep to get the resource they needed for life. Most people are not aware, and, and I wasn't until I did some reading, most people are not aware that, that sheep can actually go for months on end without, uh, without drinking. If the weather is not too hot, and they can, they can actually go without drinking. If, underscore that word, if, if there's heavy dew on the grass each morning. Sheep by habit rise just before dawn and start to feed. Or if there's a bright moonlight, they'll, they'll even feed during the night. The early hours or when the vegetation is drenched with dew and, and sheep can keep fit on the amount of water that's taken in from the foliage uh, when they graze just before and after dawn. Dew is clean. It's pure. And, and it's, a, it's a great source of water for sheep. The good shepherd makes sure his sheep are out and grazing uh, on this on the dew uh, drenched vegetation just before the sun rises in the morning on the home ranch or out in the field the shepherd sees to it that his sheep benefit from early grazing so dew can provide the water the moisture that's necessary for sheep the deep well is another way that sheep can find water uh, it, it's that deep well doesn't just naturally appear for the most part. Somebody has dug that well, gone to great effort. But the good shepherd knows where the wells are located. And uh, the shepherd is the one who has to draw the water from the well and provide it for his sheep. Bucket by bucket, he has to draw it up, pour it out into the trough, and then the sheep are able to drink from it and, and their bodies are satisfied. God does that for us, doesn't he? Through his spirit. He provides the water of life. And, and because of him, we don't have to thirst. You know, I, I do not understand how some folks 
go through life without the, the fellowship of the saints. I, when I miss a Sunday, I feel like something's missing. Uh, you know, it, it's, just, it, it's just something that's not right with, with me. And so I need to be in the fellowship of the saints. I think it's because in the fellowship of the saints, I, I'm getting that freshness from the dew. I'm getting that water that's from the deep well that is provided through the fellowship of the saints when God Almighty pours out his blessings upon the fellowship. We try to satisfy our thirst by drinking from other pools. Um, I, I'm not going to meddle or anything here, but ha have you ever wondered why places like the corner bar is kept so dark? It's for anonymity. Where people are looking for fellowship, they don't really want to be known by too many. It may be that they're afraid they'll run into the preacher there. I don't know. But uh, we, we start looking in all the wrong places. And, and we, we, we might look for, to the world of business to, to be satisfied. Or we might look to the, to the world of sports to be satisfied. Some look in, 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 in all the wrong places thinking they'll, they'll be satisfied. But you know what? Only the good shepherd knows where the still waters are, where the deep waters are. And only he can satisfy us to all fullness. There's a third source of water, and that's from creeks and streams. You know what I think is kind of funny about this is that we like sheep, we're kind of afraid of too much of God. Have you ever thought about that? I want just enough of God to make me feel good on Sunday, but not enough of God to make me do something during the week, like tell somebody about my faith. Have you ever thought about that? When I was in youth group in 1804, we sang a song about Sunday's Child or one of the musicals we did. Sunday's child don't be a Sunday's child. You know what a Sunday's child is? It's one that comes in for an hour on Sunday, tolerates the preaching, and think that they've been filled to overflowing and it'll last them for the rest of the week or for the rest of the month. And I don't understand that kind of philosophy. Uh, I don't understand that because... Sheep have to be led to still waters or they won't drink. There's something about being led by the great shepherd to that pure crystal water that makes all the difference. And that's not just on Sundays. It's every day. It's all the way. Think about it. And then David says... He restores my soul. Wait, 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 wait. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He's taking me to where I need to go to eat. He, he leads me beside the still water. He's given me what I need to quench my thirst. So what does he mean here when he says he restores my soul? In studying this psalm, it has to be remembered. It's important to remember who's writing it. A sheep, a sheep is writing this, David. And David remembers that a sheep in the good shepherd's care finds what he needs when he is following the good shepherd's way. It's essential that Christians belong in the family of God and participate in the family of God. And so we can boast in our relationship and I think that's what David is doing here. David is saying, I am a sheep. I'm going to put this in parentheses, okay? You ready? I am a sheep. I'm really too dumb to go to a running brook and drink out of the brook because if I go to running water, I'll stand there and die of thirst before I, before I drink because I'm afraid of it. 
I'm really too dumb to go to the well and, 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 and drink from the well. I'm really too dumb to avoid the pitfalls and drink out of one of those, those uh, polluted pods. End of parentheses. Now, he doesn't say that, but I think there's a part of it there because David knows what sheep are like. And so David, having said, the Lord is my shepherd and the water and the green grass and all that stuff, he then says, it's he and he alone who restores my soul. Hmm. Why does he make this statement? Because I think David knows that we, 21 centuries later, are just like he was, or actually more than that, many centuries later. Some think that because David was a good shepherd himself, because David became the king of Israel, there, there are some that think that uh, he had it made. But what I think David is saying to us is, listen to me. The only way my soul is satisfied is in following him. It would be an incorrect assumption to say that because I go to church on Sunday, all of my needs, spiritual needs, are met. It would be an incorrect assumption to say of someone who has wealth, well, they've got all they need. It would be a, an incorrect assumption to say of someone who has obtained great things through degrees or through hard work that they have all that they need. David, the author of this psalm, who was much loved by God, knew what it was to be cast down and dejected. David tasted defeat, defeat in his life and he felt the frustration of having fallen into temptation. David was acquainted with the bitterness of, of feeling hopeless and without strength in himself. In fact, in Psalm 42, 11, David cries out, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou. In God. Only those who've read a lot or who are intimately acquainted with sheep understand what cast down means. What being a cast sheep means. It's an old English term that shepherds used for a sheep that's turned on its back and cannot get up again by itself. A cast Sheep is a pathetic sight. Lying on its back, its feet up in the air, it flays about frantically, struggling to stand up without success. Sometimes it, it will bleed a little for help, but generally it lies there, lashing about in frightened frustration. And if the owner of that sheep doesn't arrive on the scene within a reasonably short time, that sheep will die. There's another reason why it's so essential for a careful shepherd to look over his flock every day, to count them, to know how many there are and who might be missing. Because you see, when a sheep is cast down, there's only a short time before it's lost forever. And the shepherd who counts and finds that one or two are gone realizes that one of my sheep is cast somewhere and I must go and search and set it, set it on its feet once again. It's not only the shepherd who keeps a sharp eye out for cast sheep, but it's also predators like buzzards and vultures and dogs and coyotes and cougars and on and on you might go. When a sheep is cast down, they become easy prey and death itself is not far off. Think about that in relationship to two-legged sheep like you and me. When we're not in fellowship, when we're not in the word of God, 
We have a tendency to drift away and become like a cast sheep on our backs, unable to make it. This knowledge that a cast sheep is helpless, close to death and vulnerable to attack, makes this whole problem of cast sheep a, a serious one for the good shepherd. Nothing seems to, to arouse his constant care and diligent attention to his flock as, as does a missing sheep, a cast down sheep. Actually, when you look at the flock, the shepherd realizes, and, and this is where we have to be real careful, Gaskin, so watch how you say this. It's actually the fat sheep that are the most easily cast. In this case, he's actually talking about F-A-T, like we get on us, overweight. Listen, this is how it happens. The rest of the story. A heavy, fat, or long fleece sheep will lie down trying to get comfortable in their recliners, in, in, in wherever, out of the field. And, and they might find a, you know, a little hollow or something, and they'll lie down, and, and that fat sheep may roll on its side, but when it rolls on its side, it keeps on going, and it can't get up. In the immortal words of Urkel, I've fallen, and I can't get up. And if you don't know who Urkel is, I can't explain it to you. But sheep that are overweight, lying down, will then become cast as they roll a little bit farther. And it's quite impossible for them to regain their feet. And think about this. Does that not happen in life for two-legged sheep? We get so comfortable self-indulgent, over, and we become helpless. And as the sheep lies there struggling, gases begin to build up in the rumen. Now, I actually had about five or six pages on this, but for your sake, I cut them out, okay? But let me just tell you this. Sheep are a lot like us in more ways than we want to know because a sheep has a four-part stomach. <laughs> so do I, you know? There's the chocolate stomach, the lasagna stomach, and four-part stomach. The rumen occupies a large percentage of the abdominal cavity uh, uh, of the ruminant. Uh, it, it's, it's a large storage area for food, if you would. That's, that's food that's quickly consumed. And, and then later, it's kind of gross, it's later regurgitated rechewed, re-swallowed in the process that we call cud chewing. We, we do that with gossip. Right? right? Hmm. Rumination or cud chewing occurs primarily when the animal's resting and not eating. Healthy, mature sheep will chew their cuds for several hours each day. The rumen is a large fermentation vat, that storage area. It contains billions of, of microorganisms, including bacteria and protozoa and, and other such things that I couldn't pronounce, so I didn't put them in my notes. Because if I can't pronounce them, I figure you don't need to know what they are. Uh, anyway, this the ruminants uh, help in the, the uh, digestion of fibrous um, feeds such as grain and hay and silage, and, and, and so forth, that not all animals can digest. Fermentation in the rumen produces enormous qualities of gas that ruminants uh, get rid of by belching or burping, just the way a sheep is made. Anything that interferes with that belching becomes life-threatening. Now, let me tell you where I'm going with this. Lest you sit out there and go, why is he telling me this? Because don't we get led astray? And don't we have a problem 
the further away we get with this very same kind of thing, that we, we get things that build up in us, that we lie down, we put our feet up, we get comfortable in the world, and we're a cast sheep. And that can lead to death for the four-legged kind and spiritual death for the two-legged kind. As these gases expand, they tend to retard and they cut off blood uh, circulation for the sheep. And, and the good shepherd knows if the weather is real hot and, and sunny, a, a sheep can die in a very short few hours. If it's a cool and cloudy day, the sheep might go for several days in a very painful death. If cast sheep is with Lambs are little sheep, baby sheep, a ewe has lambs, then it's a multiple loss for the shepherd. And so the good shepherd knows not only is he caring for one, but he could be caring for multiple. And so the good shepherd knows what the sheep needs. And so the shepherd has to be on constant watch for the sheep. And I tell you all this because Jesus, the good shepherd, is on constant watch for you. And he gives us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to be together as the saints of God in fellowship with God, in the word of God, learning about God, that we might be out in the world speaking of God and leading others to him as well. The good shepherd is on constant watch for the sheep. For the shepherd, numbers are important. And don't ever let somebody tell you in the church, well, numbers don't mean a thing. Yes, they do. If they didn't, there wouldn't be a book in the Bible called Numbers. Hmm, think about it. They matter. Why? Because every one of us is a number. And we count in the eyes of Almighty God. And the good shepherd needs to account for every one of the sheep. If the shepherd sees a buzzard circling overhead, he knows that in all probability one of his sheep is in danger. And he better head in that direction. And I would say to, to deacons in the church, Leaders in the church, Sunday school directors, elite, uh, teachers in the church. Listen, if one of your number is away, don't wait for the buzzards to get them. Go and seek them and see if you can bring about their salvation. Not their eternal salvation, but the salvation back into the fold. When the shepherd finds a cast down sheep, he runs toward him knowing that every minute is critical. There's truly a sense of fear and joy in that shepherd. Fear that it might be too late, but joy when that one is found. The first impulse for the shepherd in finding the sheep is to pick it up, but that's not good. Tenderly, the sheep has to be rolled on its side. It has to allow those gases to be removed from the body. That relieves from the rumen, the, the gases. And, and then if it's been down for a long while, the shepherd has to take that sheep and get it back up on its legs, between the shepherd's legs, rubbing the legs to get the circulation going. Do you see the tenderness involved here? The great shepherd knows your need. And sometimes he takes you even closer to himself to help get the circulation going. He rubs those legs until that, she that sheep can actually start walking on its own. And sometimes that poor sheep will fall again. The shepherd has to lift that sheep up. We can't give up on the sheep. All the time he's caring for that one sheep, that good shepherd has to care for the entire flock as well. We have a God who can do just that. And the very thought that we find here in these first couple of verses in, in Psalm chapter 23, when David says, the Lord is my shepherd and the grass he leads me to is green, the water he leads me to is pure. David say, that good shepherd, amen, he restores my. You know, a lot of people go out of church on Sunday 
filled with the joy of Jesus. A lot of people get filled on the way home with the joy of crucifying somebody in church. We Baptists are known for fried chicken, right? But too many Christians have fried preacher or fried deacon or fried whomever. Aren't we glad that our good shepherd, our great shepherd, God Almighty, restores our soul and not takes away from us? At this point, I think it's important for me to point out, with just a couple minutes left, that the Christian life and the life of a sheep have something in common. Just because you make it in the world doesn't mean you've made it in Christ. I do not understand something that's going on in our world today. Why are people looking toward actors for their word on politics? Why are people looking towards sports figures for their word on religion or politics? Most of them are so far away from God, it's, it's unbelievable. Look for a good example. Look for someone who's actually following Christ. Look for someone who knows who Jesus is and lives for Jesus. One of the great revelations that I find here in this 23rd chapter is that the great shepherd has compassion for cast men and women. And do we not need to have compassion for those that are struggling? I, I find myself being often too quick to judge I'm so glad my God is not that way. When I read the real life story of Jesus Christ, when I really get serious and read about my Jesus, and that's why I'm trying to help us through this series of sermons. When I think about who Jesus really is, I think of my Jesus as the one who came for cast sheep because that's the way I was. And that's the way too many are today. And so many of them, a part of the church. I, I've run out of time, but let me just quickly give you the last couple of things. First of all, just some ideas on, on, on cast sheep. The idea of looking for a soft spot is what causes many Christians to be cast down. The sheep that choose the comfortable, soft, rounded hollows in the ground usually just roll right on over and, and they're down. Listen, if you're not being challenged, if you're not at work, you're missing out on so much. Right? In the Christian life, there's a great danger in always looking for the easy place, the cozy corner, the comfortable position. One Sunday in Gloucester, in the church, Bill Corey pastored and where I followed. Somebody came through the door over to my right and said, Pastor, we have no one in the nursery today and we have a bunch of kids back there. Would you ask the church if anybody could go and stay in the nursery? And I made the announcement. There are no nursery workers or one nursery worker. Anybody willing to, to go down there and keep the nursery? Nobody moved. I said, they need somebody in the nursery today. Nobody moved. So I left the pulpit and started down the hallway or started toward the... Suddenly, six people jumped up. They weren't going to let me go, but they weren't going to go themselves without some kind of motivation. Let me tell you what, don't choose the easy spot. Get involved. There's another aspect of a sheep that causes them to get cast down, and that's too much wool. Um, a sheep is in the business of growing wool, but if they get too much wool because they've been neglected, they neglect self, that too much wool can cause them to be cast down. Wool in scripture depicts that old life, the old self-life uh, for Christians. It's the outward expression of that inner attitude that continues to hold on to the world and not on to Jesus. It's significant to me that a high priest was never allowed to wear wool when entering the holy of holies. 
I'm sure there's more to it than that. But maybe it was speaking of self, of pride, of personal preference. And God doesn't tolerate that. Last thing is, cast down sheep. And I said this earlier, it comes about when a sheep is just too fat. It's simply self-indulgence. When we get so caught up in the things of the world that weight, and I'm not talking about the weight that's on your body, but the weight that's in your mind and heart just causes you to be drawn away. Uh, people who spend their time, all their time, in building a career uh, lose out on their families, lose out on the spiritual a joy of serving the Lord. Material success is no measure of spiritual health. The Lord is my shepherd. That's something I have to remember. He's my shepherd. And my shepherd knows my needs. And my shepherd leads me in the paths that lead to green pastures. And in the path that leads me beside those still waters. My great shepherd provides for me all that I need. The question is, am I paying attention to the shepherd or to the things of the world? We come now to our invitational time. We sing the song, Jesus Paid It All. The question is, do we really believe that? Do we really believe that Jesus paid it all? And if he paid it all, made the greatest sacrifice of all, are we the kind of folks that are thankful for what he's done and show our thanks to him by the way we live our lives? You know, there's going to be some more basketball games this afternoon and somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. Somebody's going to be sad and somebody's going to be glad. But think about this. When they take their last breath and they journey into the unknown world, how many will be saddened when they hear Jesus say, depart from me, I never knew you. That cast down sheep that is not lifted up is lost forever. So my friends, if Jesus paid it all for you and for me, the greatest thing we can do is serve him daily. And then we can go and tell all the world about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I stand at the front this morning as the first sheep that needs to confess and get right with God. And I invite you to come to the altar in prayer. I invite you into the fellowship of Four Mile Creek. I invite you to share with one another the joy of Jesus. We stand, we sing. As God leads, how will you respond? Jesus paid it all.